Fine at DC. I know. We'll be okay. Because this is how we survive. We tell ourselves that we are the walking dead. We live in a world of industry. You wake up and go to work, then spend the days crunching numbers or delivering pizzas. But what if that was all lost? What if in a moment, everything you knew was gone? Would the world as we're so comfortable with turn into anarchy and chaos? These are the themes which make The Walking Dead, a series which has become my recent obsession. About a year ago, I watched season one and fell in love. Since then, I've watched the entire series, read all of the comics, played the amazing Telltale games, tried watching the spin-offs, and blew a shitload of money on compendiums. Despite all of this, I regret nothing. The Walking Dead is unlike any series I've ever seen. I went from never reading comic books to finishing issue 100 to 193 in two days. With that, and the fact that we're on the brink of three new spin-offs for the show, I wanted to go through everything that makes this series so special to me, and why it's my favorite show of all time. Also, disclaimer, this series gets pretty dark, and certain sections will go into topics that are labeled as triggering and offensive. Yeah, I know, I usually don't give a fuck on this channel, but trust me, some of this stuff is a little bit more on the nose. <laughs> but with that out of the way, strap in, grab your snake meat, and let's get right into it. The Walking Dead is a comic book series written by Robert Kurtman. Although it gained popularity amongst comic readers, the AMC adaption starting in 2010 has become a worldwide phenomenon. It's since spawned numerous spin-offs, games, and even had a movie planned at one point. I will be going over random parts of both the books, show, and games to truly encapsulate what in my eyes makes this series great. Which brings me here, to episode 4 of season 1, Vados. In terms of the rest of the show, this episode isn't really special, but in my eyes, it brought out the dark and demented element of the series to the screen for the first time. That wasn't just a random walker girl getting shot. During this episode, we see the camp group truly develop, with the focus being on Andrea and Amy. They take a ride out on a boat to go fishing where they reminisce on the world before, and their father. Alright, remember his rule, no crying in the boat. <sighs> Scares the fish. The acting through this entire scene is so compelling with a clear bond between Andrea and Aime. Later, when we come back to the camp, the group sits around a fire eating the fish Andrea and Amy caught, with everyone conversing as if the world wasn't in rubble. Amy then goes to the bathroom in the RV. I have to pee. When she goes back out to ask for toilet paper, this happens. <laughs> I can't really show a lot of the more brutal scenes from this show since the blood and overall gore is just too much for YouTube, but if you haven't seen this show, go watch it. Why are you here? The entire idea of building up a character like Amy, who has such a compelling dynamic with her sister just to kill her off immediately, showed the hopelessness this world brings. Not to say Amy's death felt useless like some later characters. Amy felt like a person you actually care about tragically dying, with you being able to do nothing to stop it. The power behind caring for someone like a sister or son just to see them struck and down too soon is what makes this series so emotional to me. Throughout the first season of the Telltale game, we see our group become more hardened and mature, moving on from random people who met on a farm to survivors. One of the most shocking moments for me came in Chapter 3, Long Road Ahead. Lee and Kenny go back to the pharmacy to get whatever medical supplies they can find. They hear a girl call for help, but when they see her, they realize she's surrounded by walkers. The game then gives you a choice to either put her out of her misery, but attract attention to yourself or letting them eat her alive. I mean, we leave her alive and she draws them all to her. If you choose to do nothing, the looting through the pharmacy has her screaming perpetually in the background until she dies. Yeah, that's just a little fucked up, isn't it? In season 4B of the show, we see our group scattered, attempting to reunite with one another with no information to go off. 
The groups on the road to Terminus had some pretty compelling dynamics, with the most unique story lying in Tyrese and Carol. They were the only ones not actively looking for a way to Terminus, and instead, they ended up hauling up in a cabin. Carol had previously taken on the obligation of caring for two girls, Mika and Lizzie, after their dad had died in the prison due to the plague. Can you look out for them? Once the prison was attacked and burned down, Carol found the two girls along with Tyrese and Judith. We see this group do their best to live with little hope. Throughout this, we learn more of the girls, though, seeing Lizzie as not the brightest, still looking at the walkers as harmless animals. Whilst Mika is a lot smarter, with Carol saying she has confidence that Mika will be able to guide Lizzie later on in life. Lizzie's bigger than you, and in some ways she's stronger, but you're smarter, and you understand these things things. You gotta look out for her. Well, that is until... Don't worry. She'll come back. I didn't hurt her brain. Lizzie turns out to be a bit of a psychopath. She feeds walkers, dissects and murders rats, and believes that everyone is destined to turn into a zombie, in a process that's almost as beautiful as a butterfly. Jokes aside, Lizzie kills her sister. She even states that she will be back soon, and says everybody should join her, putting an emphasis on Judith. A fucking baby! But Judith can change too. I was just about to... She can't even walk you. Carol sees no other choice, and in one of the most heartbreaking scenes of the entire show, she is forced to put down Lizzie. This scene is actually a story that was adapted from the comics, though. Mind you, it went a lot differently. In the comics, Carl, who's still around 9 or 10, sneaks out to kill Billy for the good of the group. Carl has most of his innocence in the book, especially, completely stripped away from him at a very young age. He also is the first character in the novel to kill a living person, when he shoots Shane in the neck for threatening Rick, already showing that Rick's family will do whatever it takes to survive. They measure you by what they can take from you, by how they can use you to live. One of my favorite scenes in the entire show was during the group's entry into Alexandria. The sense of realism behind Deanna's interview with Rick is so thrilling to me. Aaron says I can trust you. Aaron doesn't know me. I've killed people. I don't even know how many by now. Andrew Lincoln really does give the performance of a lifetime here. He looks genuinely scarred as he tells of the horrors that the group went through. Throughout all of it though, he makes one thing clear. Nothing matters anymore besides survival. Because it's all about survival now. At any cost. This interview came after two of the most brutal sequences of villain deaths in the entire show. I'll get to Terminus later, but A is definitely a talking point. In the show, a biker gang that had been tracking Rick, Michonne, and Carl finally catches up to them. Having all of them pinned down, they turn on Daryl as one of the men attempts to... <clears throat> ...with Carl. In the middle of this chaos, with his son about to be violated, Rick headbutts the man with the gun and proceeds to bite his neck off. This scene is way too fucking gory to show, but that's the point. The group then proceeds by slaughtering the others, and Daryl and Rick have a conversation about what it means to be too far gone. For this brief moment, I would like to switch over to the comic books to illustrate a more meaningful conversation than what happened in the show. In the books, Rick, Abraham, and Carl had gone out on an expedition for supplies. In this search, they get jumped by random crazy people, yada yada yada, Rick bites the guy's neck off. You know how it goes. Abraham and Rick end up having a similar conversation, with Abraham telling Rick that there is no coming back from doing what he just did. Rick's response that he'll do whatever it takes to protect his family prompts Abraham to tell his backstory. At the beginning of the apocalypse, Abraham had been with a group of survivors along with his wife and two kids. Whilst out on a supply run, a group of males do unspeakable things to his wife and six-year-old daughter, forcing their eight-year-old son to watch. Abraham proceeds to explain that when he got back and found out what the men had done, he ended up tearing them limb from limb, with his family watching. This caused them to run away in horror. The most heartbreaking thing is the next time Abraham would find his family, they were all dead. 
I would like to say most of these insane events that happen across the series don't feel unrealistic. The power of Abraham's speech after Rick had done such a violent and seemingly unredeemable act shows human nature at its scariest. Which brings me to my next point. This in our pants yet? Boy, do I have a feeling we're getting close. The Saviors are the definition of survival of the fittest. Negan runs an operation of men outsourcing enslaved labor from neighboring communities for his own benefit. With all of this, he keeps them in check in quite questionable ways. You said I could do it. The Saviors are engrossed with the idea of control. You work for me now. Negan states openly that he wants people, even returning Carl unharmed after he had broken into the sanctuary and shot it up. Despite what that Carl thing might have you believe, the means by which the Saviors take control are pretty fucking brutal. To care about someone, love someone, see someone grow up, and then have to watch them get brutally murdered right in front of your fucking eyes. This is the cruelty that the saviors use to keep people in check. They even killed the show. They act to consistently be feared, even if it means... And they killed one of us, Rory. He was 16 years old. They beat him to death right in front of us. The Terminus Cannibals are probably the most defined example of what this world could do to somebody so quickly. No, they're definitely not the most far gone group, but they trick and eat people with their counterparts in the book even describing their palates of human. In the show, it's clear that they have been very shaped by the world they suffer in. Gareth even tells Rick it was what they needed to do to survive. I know that you've been out there, but I can see it. You don't know what it is to be hungry. Rick and the group deal with them, but not after getting clarity. You do this to anyone, right? Besides, I already made you a promise. No! The book gets way more fucked up in every way, even when it's compared to season 3, which was brutal. Many people are familiar with Michonne and the governor's relationship being pretty hostile, but not many people know the origin of her disdain for him. But looking at the comics, it just makes so much more sense. After Michonne attacks the governor for chopping Rick's hand off, yes, all of that happens in the comics, Michonne is taken and tied up. What comes next, I think you can infer. As torture for Glenn, the governor forces him to listen while he's doing it, just leading to one of my favorite but most disturbing panels in pretty much all of comics, where we see the sounds of the governor and Michonne in the background of Glenn listening and slowly crying. Yeah, humanity's rock fucking bottom. The governor does get what he deserves in the book. Michonne kinda loses it when she escapes. She sneaks into his apartment and mutilates him, consistently talking of her enjoyment of it. The level of depth that these characters have is insane to me. Michonne is far from a bad person, but I was appalled by just how gory she gets in the comics. It wasn't in the manner that I was sad for the governor, the piece of shit deserved it. I was more so stunned by what the world had turned Michonne into, how her time in Woodbury completely changed her. She even acknowledged it later when she talks to herself, saying it was uncalled for. One of my favorite parts about The Walking Dead was just how accurately it displayed a change in someone. The visual differences of the characters across both the show and the comics, along with how they act, The Walking Dead is unparalleled when it comes to showing grief, trauma, and even awkward joy. The concept of characters breaking comes throughout this entire franchise. In the books, when a character died, the corresponding people who cared would usually go through a very understandable fuck you phase. Alan became a complete dick after Donna died, Michonne went out to sea, we saw Carol take her own life in the book, Morgan admitted he was feeding people to his dead son. The concept of someone breaking is beautifully executed in this series. The amount of realism behind each scene, each panel, each fucking analog stick move, it's insane. I mean, Maggie becomes a vessel after Glenn's death. Lauren Cohan is so talented for this acting. Although it's kind of crazy to talk about people breaking and not talk about... 
Hey, Herschel, man, let me ask you something. Did a living, breathing person, did they walk away from this? <laughs> yeah, Shane was fucking mental. Try to kill each other, man. In the show, we see Shane turn into a well-respecting guy to a violent, merciless killer focused on desire. After we see him take Otis to get the supplies and just sacrifice him, there's a permanent change in Shane. The scene where he shaves his head, showing that the old Shane was now physically and metaphorically fucking gone, it's so perfect. It makes that final standoff between him and Rick so much more impactful. Shane was broken, gone, completely into his own animalistic urges by his death on the show. John Bernthal manages to not only give an intense but also realistic performance here, generally making one of the most horrifying transformations in a person in all of television. What you know about what I can live with? You got no idea what I can live with, what I live with! You wanna talk about what I can do, Rick? How about what you can do? Here I am. Come on, man, raise your gun. I want to cover the comic's way of showing a character's insanity while still keeping them, well, not fucking awful. We watch Rick begin to talk with dead people on an unplugged phone. He ends up taking his phone along with him, talking to Lori. Knowing he's insane and what he's doing is fucking crazy, but clinging on to it until Rick becomes ready to let go. Moving on. Did any person here who would live in peace and fairness. Who would find common ground. This world is yours by right. We are life. That's death. And it's coming for us. Unless we stand together to go home. And then the work begins. The new world begins. The thing that I probably love most about The Walking Dead is the idea of hope in a hopeless world. The group takes beaten after beaten, but learns to overcome it and grow. No Way Out is probably the clearest example of this. The fight for Alexandria was mark of change in The Walking Dead. We saw our group come into Alexandria very, very distrusted, and the question if the Alexandrians could become fighters became bigger and bigger. That all culminates in No Way Out. We see the group fight people, themselves, and of course a lot of walkers. Carl's eye getting shot is still to me one of the biggest gut dropping moments in any show. <laughs> Rick then just immediately going out and fucking massacring hundreds of walkers is so amazing and invigorating. This of course transforms into the fight for Alexandria, where we see our characters realize the need to build back their home. No more searching, it's time for the rebirth of life. Rick is dead set on that mindset right after No Way Out in the comics. It's a bit more questionable in the show about this rebuild of the world. In the show, Rick becomes way more keen after the standoff with Negan, though. The speech and overall action is so well done across both the show and the comic, where Rick just slits Negan's throat and then becomes dead set on not killing him. The realization that the world is not about violence, the discovery that killing will just continue the cycle, it's so raw. It shows the walking Dead's underlying message so well that humanity will prevail. As cliche as that Carl line might be, It's not gonna be enough, Dad. Enough what? Hope. The Walking Dead is about hope. We see people endure unimaginable horrors, watching family members torn limb from limb, having to put down your own kid. It's powerful, it's emotional, it's beautiful. I love the- Losing someone is one of the greatest sadnesses in the world. To be on their bedside knowing that they're going to be gone in a couple minutes, it's tragic. Issue 167 is the issue where Andrea dies in the comics. We become very connected with Andrea throughout the comics. We see her grieve, grow, and even learn to relove. The actual goosebumps I have from just thinking of her death issue is insane. Watching her frail in bed, turning Rick away at the sight of him crying because she doesn't want her last moments to be in sadness. 
us. Then seeing people go through saying their goodbyes, it's so powerful. The moment she shares with Carl telling him that she's just going to be another name on a list of people Carl's met in his life, convincing him that he'll be over her death in no time, seeing Rick go up to her for their final talk with the bond that they made over the fact that they don't die now being over, Rick crumbles, even saying he can't go on prompting her to scream at him. Her final words even reflect in her so much, with Rick saying, I love you so much, with her response being, yeah, you do. It's so fucking real. I was bawling my eyes out. Rick refuses to kill her, screaming, I can't do this, until she finally attacks him, making him have to stab her. The issue ends with Rick breaking down in tears, and the community comes to comfort him. There's even a letter from Robert Kirkman himself about his own grief from killing off Andrea. This issue completely broke me, something very few pieces of media have been able to accomplish. I had tears from her death. It felt like an actual person in my life who I I care deeply about had died. The Walking Dead is emotional. It's aggressive. It's raw. It's uncensored. It can be flat out depressing. And that's why I love it. I love The Walking Dead. Good night.